All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Jason Camus here with Good News Gardener, and uh, we're excited to be here on this uh, rainy morning. It's I don't know if it's still raining in Gardner, but I'm uh, doing this from home. So uh, I will tell everybody that the, the sun is breaking out a little bit down here. The clouds are breaking, so it's not going to rain all day. But uh, we're kind of excited today. We have uh, Aaron Otto, uh, the executive director of the Johnson County Airport Commission with us this morning. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning, Jason. And uh, Adam, how are things with you today? What's uh, what's new in your world? Oh, you know, outside of the the you know massive amount of rain driving in, uh, you're not a, not a ton. But uh, Aaron, I'm happy you could join us today. Absolutely, it's good to be with you guys. So, Aaron, um, National Aviation History Month. Um, you know, I thought we could kind of cover a couple things in today's show. Talk a little bit about New Century Air Center and what it has been and what it was and how it came to be. And then maybe talk a little bit about what's happening out there now. And, you know, we can tie in your role into all of that. So give us a little background on New Century Air Center. I mean, it's I think the best I know is I every once in a while I have somebody stop by the chamber office and say, you know, they were uh, they were stationed there in 1949 or something. So I know it's got a, a long and storied history. So, so give us some background here. Sure. And I think we even need to start one step higher. And it, there's a great history here at New Century with the Olathe Naval Air Station. But even stop to think about the city of Kansas. So this is, like you said, National Aviation History Month. And you think about some big names that you know because of aircraft. But you forget that a guy named Dwayne Wallace created Cessna. A person named Walter and Olivia Ann Beach created Beach Aircraft. Lloyd Stearman and the Stearman Aircraft. Al Mooney and the Mooney Aircrafts and William and Moya Lear of the Lear Jets, all of those were early pioneers in Kansas, let alone people like Amelia Earhart and the aviation world that comes from that legacy, to say the least. So when you think about just the upbringing culture, there are a few states that always claim to be kind of the birthplace of aviation, North Carolina with the Wright brothers, what took place in Ohio. But I think if you look at both the past and even the presence when it comes to aviation jobs in your state, especially per capita, Kansas still really is one of those leading groups, to say the least. So it's not, it's not just history, but in Kansas, it's still very much a real reality in life today. And the same is true at New Century. Jason, you gave a great introduction to the fact that uh, it's kind of interesting that you have to stop and think about. It. I mentioned a few minutes ago, Olathe Naval Air Station. Why in the world would there be a Navy base in the center of the United States? And prior to World War II, there was a Navy installation up by the Fairfax plant in Kansas City, Missouri, that was starting to train pilots. And they realized with the onset of World War II potentially approaching, they needed more space to do trainings and have greater throughput. They came down and bought a couple thousand acres in southwest Johnson County because most of Johnson County is a big rect a big square. Most of that stormwater flows north and east, and a little bit flows south and west. And there's a ridge line, and the airport at New Century, formerly Olathe, Olathe, Olathe Naval Air Station, sat on that ridge line. Perfectly flat land, great for training pilots and putting in an airport. So they bought in 1941 a couple thousand acres of farmland, you know, 20 plus miles south and west of the metro area at the time and put in three primary runways to do training of pilots in preparation for World War II. And boy, did they build fast. They had it put together and commissioned uh, as the first class was starting to go through in the fall of 42. And, and you think about some of the historic legacy of this place. Um, Olathe Naval Air Station here at New Century, which is between Gardner and Olathe. Uh, the first class of cadets included a guy named John Glenn. John Glenn got his military wings on the, on the same runway that's used today as the primary runway at New Century. He went on, obviously, to be an uh, early leading astronaut, let alone U.S. Senator, presidential candidate. And I have to give a shout out to the Olathe Historical Society. They've made an incredible video and documentary. It's about 17 minutes long about the history of Olathe Naval Air Station, which includes a great interview with John Glenn talking about his time here and what it was like at Olathe Naval Air. And he wasn't alone. In addition to the other thousands of pilots that were trained here, people like Bob Barker was in class number two, who would go on, obviously, to be the longtime you know, host of The Price is Right. All of those people through the their military, had their chance to stop here in Johnson County in Olathe to kind of punch their you know aviation ticket, if you will, and, and support the war effort. And what's great about the airport still today, when you think about history, is that there's still so many pieces of legacy here at New Century that are dating back to Olathe Naval Air. The building I'm sitting in right now is the administration building. It was built by the Department of War at the time for the Navy, um, and it was their administration building. I mean, there's there's Italian marble in some of the floorboard plates 
that was put in when we were at a war with Italy, if you think about it. So it's still amazing, even though they built very quickly, man, did they build some incredibly sound stuff that's been kind of built to last. Um, so we still use that. Or the fact that the water building, we're still the water provider to a giant business park, which we'll talk about in a little bit. We run about a millions of gallons of water through that a day that we buy through Gardner in the city of Olathe. It's the same building that they built in 1942 and was used for the same purpose. And you just, you know, the maintenance building, there's so many of those legacy buildings we continue to use and try to maintain today that still serve the same purpose, although not a military one. But the last thing that's really special, or I guess last two things because they're right next to each other, is that there still is one of the two major military hangars that were here at, at New Century. And that's still used by the Army Reserve. So we're really proud to still be hosting a component of the United States military here in New Century. And there's a large group of Chinooks that work out of that group that I'm sure people have heard flying around their homes. But uh, it's both a rehab training and a group that deploys, um, which takes me to my last thought about some of the history of this place. Um, it, it was a group that deployed in 2011. That was a group that unfortunately lost one of its birds um, and 31 people in a military dog were killed along with um, uh, some local individuals as well. And there's been talk about maybe building a memorial into what is still Navy Park here at New Century. And in that park today, there's still street signs along a path that are the last names of all of the pilots who trained here to Latham Naval Air and died either in the World War II or Korean conflict. And so that would be you know, fitting if the dollars can be raised and where that might go to kind of consider some kind of memorial for those folks, which was one of the largest losses of life since 2001, having 31 people die in that, that helicopter crash in 2011, to have some kind of remembrance literally just a stone's throw away from that hangar still at the, uh, at what we call the Navy park and still titled as such. So there's so many of the little pieces of history here and it, it really has come to influence um, how we operate today. I guess just to give a little bit more of the, the movement, there were three major airports as part of the Olathe Naval Air Station. The one in New Century I've been describing, the one that's now Gardner's Municipal Airport was also a takeoff and landing practice field for Olathe Naval Air. And then over at Johnson County Executive, that was known as Morris Outlining Field because it sat inside the city of Olathe. First, it was inside Morris Township, and then later it was annexed into the city of Olathe. So over time, the way these came to be part of kind of general aviation airports is that the Department of Defense started not needing this kind of capacity. And in 1954, I believe, rolled off Morris Outlining Field, and the city of Olathe took that over and ran it as basically Olathe Municipal Airport. They did that through about 1967 and then realized um, airports are kind of like parks and swimming pools or public amenities that are very hard to make profitable unless they have commercial service, which that airport did not. So on July 1st, 1967, they sold Olathe, uh, city of Olathe sold the airport to the county for a whole dollar, and that's what started the airport commission. Then uh, the Department of Defense returned the airport, which is now Gardner Municipal Airport, to the city because it sat inside their city limits and they continue to operate that today. And then in 1974, we took over the county, what it was the original part of the Olathe Naval Air Station here, which is now New Century, and have made that kind of the industrial park ever since. But that industrial park, like I said, it ran a water system that still moves a lot of water today, not just for our needs, but for the business clients here, but also had a short line railroad. So many different soldiers and sailors came in through uh, rail. Their supplies came in through rail. There was a depot, cold storage all on site. There was almost a six mile short line railroad on the premises alone. And some of that rail is it got some pretty interesting manufacturing dates because some of it's back to the time that the Navy installed. And that rail is still used today in support of the business park where there's a number of tenants who will have goods and goods shipped in, wood, steel, uh, food products. that will be part of their manufacturing process. And then those products usually go out by truck. So it's amazing that something that still was installed, you know, 75 plus years ago, not just the buildings, not just some of the water piping, but even the rail is still becoming a valid service that's being used today to support private sector jobs and economic development in the century. So that's a little bit about the evolution. We could deep dive into a number of those areas, but um, that gives a little overview. Of why was there what, a couple of questions that answers? Why was there a Navy base in the middle of Kansas or in the middle of the United States? Why are there two airports or three airports within pro close proximity of each other that do somewhat similar services in Johnson County? And then what is what is New Century today? And, and we can talk a little bit more like about that, too. But uh, I'll let you go ahead, Jason. Thank wow. you. That is, that's that's impressive. Like, I'm more impressed. I don't know if I'm more impressed by the history or the fact that you know it that well already. And I know you've been in the role for a couple of years, but um, just to be able to go back and I mean, that that's like a little pamphlet there right out of the Historical Society archives. So um, 
Also, shout out to Bob Barker. I did not realize he uh, he went through that. Uh, but uh, so, Aaron, I, I do have to ask because you always see, you know, I see the signs when I'm, I'm driving into work in Gardner, you know, land to be delete, be leased by the airport commission, uh, you know, land for uh, available. You know, what what's the future of this? I mean, we're, we're talking about the, the past, but, uh, you know, you guys clearly have some big plans. Um, you know, what what's the, the intention into the future? Sure. So th it's the dream of the Federal a federal a a Aviation Administration, the FAA. I always call them FAA, so I never think of their full name. It's their guidance for what are called general aviation airports. So those non-ticketed passenger airports like the three in Johnson County, that they try to be as self-sufficient as possible financially. Mm -hmm. And what they do with that is, is they're trying to look for ways to any land that's not needed for aviation at this time, that one, they try to find compatible businesses that are good for aviation, i.e. not really tall, not really smoky um, kind of service. And then secondly, you essentially you don't sell that land, but you ground rent it. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully you have a residual every year of a little bit of money off of those ground rents. Sometimes they own, the airport might own the, the structures itself, the vertical improvements, but usually it's just the land. In our case, we may own the land. We might own the buildings. We will own the land. We might own the buildings. We might deliver rail services to them. We will mm -hmm. deliver water to them. So there's different ways to try to make money that all kind of go back into the airport's operations. So we break the airports down into five cost centers, New Century Air Center, Johnson County Executive, the rail, the water, and the business parks. Every dime in and every dime out of our budget falls into one of those buckets. So we can see what's making money, what's supporting others. Some years there's big capital purchases, so they may not be you know, as self-sufficient as we'd like. But um, I think up to this point, the people at Johnson County should be very proud that there are thousands of general aviation airports in the United States. In Kansas, there's over 140. And recently, there really have been two that have been basically self-sufficient, even so much as they're also putting money back into their sponsor. And I'll tell you what that looks like in just a minute. But the two airports of Johnson County government runs, which is a new century and executive, they have been able through some massive expansion of the business park, really at New Century, been able to be self-sufficient financially, which means they haven't received public tax dollars since 2004. Um, and, and in some cases, we also write back, you know, several hundred thousand dollar check for insurance to the county, but we also pay for central services. We don't have our own HR. We don't have our own legal. We don't have our own, you know, uh, different central service organizations. So we write about another four hundred thousand dollar check back to Johnson County government that comes from, again, these ground rents or fuel flowage sales or something like that and, and help support. And we get services for it. So that makes sense. But that's that's a pretty unique place to be where there's just a handful in the United States that have reached that level. And there's some different reasons for that. You know, one of the largest office buildings in Kansas sits at New Century. It's the big green, uh, formerly CenturyLink, formerly Embark, formerly Sprint, formerly North Supply. It's been a 40 year run of the same brand of companies just with different variations of it in that building. That is actually a county owned building. So we got ground rent and building rent off of that. And, uh, and as people are probably well aware, uh, CenturyLink has made a business choice through a consolidation to kind of pull back their office space in Kansas City and really don't have any major office space left in Kansas City. That was their last location. So that's a building we're trying to lease right now, which has made our finances a little bit interesting, to say the least. But I have to give a lot of credit to my predecessors. It took many decades to build up the business park that today has over 60 different multinational companies here. Some of them was as few as eight employees. Some of them as many as nearly a thousand employees each. There's estimated to be about 4,500 private sector jobs here at New Century, many of which are businesses that run three shifts. And so they run all day, all night, basically. And what I think is kind of interesting is the diversity of what takes place out here. You've got folks who are doing printing and graphic designs. A lot of the campaign signs that went all over the state were printed here at New Century by one of the companies. Or you've got the food producers, which are incredible, the, the diversity of what's here. Duke's Mayonnaise, which is an incredibly um, uh, incredible brand loyalty, we'll say in the South, to the point the building manager, the, the, the uh, general manager of the plant when it opened in 2003, 2004, shortly after he opened the plant, he got a call from a woman and said, could you make a jar of Duke's Mayonnaise with my name on the label? And he said, well, I suppose, but why would I do that? And he goes, she said, well, I want my cremated ashes to be buried in it. And I looked at him and said, oh my gosh, did you make one? He goes, I think we've made three to 400 cents. I'm like, Okay, there's some incredible brand loyalty to Duke's mayonnaise. But in addition to that, you've got the only place that uh, it's now called Upfield. So if you ever look at your country crock, I cannot believe it's not butter, 
If you ever look on that package, it says made in Kansas. And it literally says made in New Century with an address here at the Mrs. Park because they consolidated eight plants down into one and did an expansion that has such efficiencies that they can beat Eastern Europe on cost because of automation. And the jobs that are created there are really, they're high skilled and high paid jobs to say the least. So, and then there's another group, Carry Ingredients. They make chocolate covered almonds for Kirkland and Costco. Talk about a good place to go visit and see how things are going because they always have the best samples. You know, and there's just such diversity of what's out here to say the least. If you're a Rotary member, which you know, Jason, we've seen you at Rotary too. That's the one place in North America that is a one-stop shop for Rotary supplies. It's a group called Hampton Russell. It's two gentlemen that started this company three three generations ago. It's still a family-owned operation. And they looked on a map and they pointed at a county map of the United States. One guy pointed at Hampton, Virginia, and one guy pointed at Russell, Kansas, and that's how they named the company. And now 100 plus years later, they've recently bought out their only competition in the United States, in North America, and they're the one-stop supply for all Rotary, from your buttons and your name tags to your shirts, your plaques, your gavels, your banners, everything. And they do other groups as well. But that's one niche that's very special that I love whenever I go speak to Rotaries. Whenever I say Hampton Russell's at New Century, they all light up because they know exactly who their supplier is for that stuff. That's just a little bit of the diversity of what's out here today. And then I, I guess to know, have, Adam. It sounds ahead. like a Christmas basket right there. We could have like, <laughs> you know, the, the, the airport commission or Johnson County could put together a little Christmas basket. We could have Duke's mayonnaise, some chocolate covered <laughs> almonds, maybe a button or, and, and even a political sign, you know, type thing. So get, uh, get the person you like. That's right. That's right. That is impressive. Well, Aaron, you know, so I, I guess, you know, you, you've covered a little bit of the history in that. So like years ago, how far back when the industrial park, um, you know, how, like how long has the industrial park been around and, and what has kind of evolved over time as it relates to that? Sure. So the business park, they really started um, repurposing old Navy buildings. And so in some cases, they tore down buildings that were dormitories or maybe wood structures. But in other cases, and there's still a number of them here today, they were put back into service either as warehouse or manufacturing firms. One of the oldest tenants that's still here from 1975, um, he started a couple different companies and he has one original Navy building. He built another one to mirror it next door to it, sits right off the Navy park, still still taking water from the same sources that would have gotten from the set from the 40s. And uh, he had one of the largest wood picture frame manufacturing companies in the United States. When he ended that company, it was like the fifth largest in the United States to put it in perspective. He still has a large wood frame crate making company that builds uh, custom made boxes for glass, for glass that's made down in Spring Hill. So a lot of that started trying to get the flywheel spinning a different business here. The first major tenant here was a group called DuPont. We haven't talked about them yet. They just celebrated 40 years at as being a tenant at New Century, originally called Industrial Airport. That was changed as a branding move to try to expand and show the diversity of what is in the business park back in 1993-94. But DuPont's been here for 40 years, huge rail user. They make a product that is found in half of all ice creams, three quarters of all power bars, and three quarters of all breads in the United States. It's a bonding agent that helps try to eliminate clunky or gaps in their product, if you will. So it's a consistent, consistent making agent, if you will. Hmm. And so they did a big expansion at, during their time here. But the point is that rolls off dollars, just like we're trying to do with rail and with water, rolls off dollars to support the airports. And I'll give you my, this is the, this is the lamest aviation joke I have or, or civil joke I have. Um, do you guys know the two types of concrete that exists? No. Yes, I do. So there's concrete that's cracked and concrete that will crack. And so ultimately you have to find a way to keep putting money into that infrastructure. So if you looked at an aerial map on you know, Google Earth, and you could see, you know, you see the runways, but we're also responsible for a lot of the roads at New Century. We're responsible for the streetlights, the water lines you can't see underground, all those rail lines, a lot of those buildings, especially the ones obviously the county still owns. And the same goes with Johnson County Executive. So it's much more infrastructure, to say the least, than, than what takes place on just this, the runways and taxiways you see. You think about a lot of the hangars that are also our responsibility. So we're fortunate to get some federal grants that help with some of those major infrastructure costs because our budget's about $7 million a year. We just replaced for the first time in a quarter century, way beyond its service life, the primary runway to Johnson County Executive. That was $6 million in itself. So you can see how some of these expenses are ginormous when it comes to those capital improvements, to say the least. But over time, the business park has grown. There's a few government tenants here, like the Johnson County Detention Facility, aka the Johnson County Jail is here at New Century. 
Uh, there's also adult residential corrections here. Wastewater has a presence here for Johnson County Wastewater, and then obviously Airport Commission. But like I said earlier, there's almost about 4,500 private sector jobs here just on the west side alone on these long-term land leases. And that's including kind of that empty office building. That office building was filled. That number would probably go up almost 1,000, if not more. Wow. And so the goal for the future, I think that you're heading towards, Jason, is um, that is all west of the primary runway and off a of New Century Parkway. We've been working for a number of years and development never goes quickly, as you're well aware in the chamber world. Development never goes quickly, that we're working on trying to do an expansion to our east side. Because the reality is we um, these ground leases have inflationary build-ins about every 10 years built in to notch up. They don't keep up with the cost of what concrete, asphalt, water line replacement cost. So the way that we need to keep to try to maintain to be as self-sufficient as possible is to be in a spot where we are continuing to expand the business park, bring on new tenants, bring on new rail clients, bring on new water clients. And so the airport at one point had a vision of having a second runway, primary runway, and at some point becoming a commercial airport. The FAA has kind of indicated that that's unlikely that they would support a second commercial airport until your MSA, your metropolitan statistical area of Kansas City, would reach three plus million. And that's, that's many, many years, if not decades down the road. We're at about 2.1 in that measurement today. So, and with the new expansion at, at uh, MCI with the new terminal, that's where the airport commission kind of backed away along with some other development that already was happening off premises at the end of where that runway would have been and decided to turn that into uh, developable land. So we went through a long process with the Federal Aviation Administration to release that land in order to develop uh, almost 500 acres on the east side of the runway. So it's kind of bookend between 159th Street to the north and Clare or Industrial mm -hmm. Highway on the east. And then also to the north of the around the primary runway, there's another couple, almost 100, almost 200 acres up there. And the goal is we've brought on a master developer who's going to be a, a private sector business partner with us to try to help speed up that development and unlock the value of that land today. It's hay and in some cases soybeans. And it's been that almost since as long as we can find records for it, the few homestead houses that have gone away over the years. And so this is a huge opportunity to bring new jobs to Johnson County long term, new construction jobs to Johnson County. And a lot of new tax revenue to the city, to, not to the city in this case, because we're in an unincorporated, but to the school district, the county, the library, the parks, you know, the fire district will all see a huge increase from this new, this new vertical improvements that take place out here. And the advantage just to, to, to kind of say why this matters, because there's a lot of great land in Johnson County to develop, is that we're hoping that our niche will be that this is the only land in Johnson County, but really almost in the metro area that we're aware of. That one is open land next to a, a tier one class one railroad, which in this case is Burlington Northern Santa Fe. Their transcon that runs from Long Beach to Chicago runs just south of the airport. And currently that is the spur that serves our shoreline railroad as well. So one is next to a railroad. Two, it's open land that will allow for laydown yards. And that's a big deal for some groups. Maybe it's transload or maybe it's just temp storage of some, some product like gravel or something. And then third, it's also as a short line. So BNSF can drop off and they do that regularly drop off 20 cars and our job becomes distributing those 20 cars to the different tenants of the business park. And they love that because they can drop and we kind of do that last mile delivery for them and get a little bit of money for it, obviously, but it makes their life so much simpler because they, they don't have to sit and do that kind of last minute distribution or that last mile delivery. So we're hopefully very bullish and have heard good speculative comments about the fact that there are businesses that have interest in siting in Kansas city that can't find those three elements in one place. And so we've just started to get this put into place. We're still working on agreements with BNSF and some others on, on allowing that vision to take place. But my hope is, and again, development takes time, but you know, in the next two to five years, you do start seeing some vertical growth. All of that land on the east side and north side could be rail served. And you start seeing more of that kind of commerce coming to Southwest Johnson County. That's huge. That's definitely huge. So, Aaron, you know, you keep bringing up the commission, and I think we're taking for granted somewhat that, that people out there know what the commission is. Um, so, so talk a little bit about the commission. What, what's the makeup of the commission? You know, um, you know what, what does the commission do? Sure. So there's two, I, I've, I've spoken commission very loosely. There are two commissions that I'm very grateful to get a chance to work with. First is the Board of County Commissioners. Every county in Kansas has a Board of County Commissioners. Johnson County has a seven member elected Board of County Commissioners. There's six by districts and then one overall at large chairman. Sure. And so we're represented in the sixth district, which is Olathe and kind of a lot of the western part of unincorporated Johnson County, DeSoto, Gardner, Edgerton are all in that district. And then um, that's that group 
has delegated by statute the responsibilities of overseeing Johnson County's airport and that economic development arm to a thing called the Johnson County Airport Commission. So each county commissioner appoints an airport commissioner. So there are seven and seven. And that is my boss. Those are my bosses as well. They hire my position. And in many ways, my job is then to hire the staff and execute the budget, the policies and direction that they want us to go forward with. So the direction they've given me is be as self-sufficient as possible, find economic development and private sector job growth, you know, and obviously use those dollars to support our primary mission, which is aviation and um, really providing those services. We just rewrote, to put it in perspective, our mission statement. And it's very simple. It has two parts. One is to support people's aviation, hobby, recreational, or business needs. We don't own any aircraft. That might surprise people. We don't provide any service. If you called and said, I want to charter a jet, I would say, here are three fixed-based operators you can talk to, or you know, depending which airport you're at, because we only provide the infrastructure to let that happen. But the second part of our business or our mission statement is that we also unlock economic development opportunities. And that's trying to, again, turn like this dirt we've talked about on the east side from soybean fields into, you know, large warehouses, manufacturing, distribution centers, similar to what's on the west side of the airport today in the existing business park. So um, the Johnson County Airport Commission are all volunteers. It's a great mix of people. Some are pilots, but the name is a little misleading because a lot of what we deal with is not aviation. It's what creates the dollars to support aviation, but uh, we have architects, um, some great financial backgrounds. We have a past city administrator who used to work with a large airport like ours in his city in Kansas, who's now retired in Johnson County. And he's great for that kind of experience of what they've done, where they've been. They were an old military base also. So the commonalities are, are hugely overlapping. And there's a former mayor of Gardner, which I appreciate that's on our airport commission. And Carol Lehman has been wonderful because she understands and works for the community college right now, trying to build bridges between the private sector and educational world. How do we do more job training to create a better trained, educated workforce? So she's stupendously helpful in terms of bringing an, another perspective to this group. So that group meets usually about once a month. And, uh, and again, I'm very, very happy to have their help and support and, and just their tireless champions for definitely not just aviation, but also economic development in Johnson County. It's awesome. I think I, I do want to say if Carol, if you're watching this right now, this is like the third show in a row that you've been mentioned. So at some point, I think, in the, I think it for like in the if you work in the fire department, you usually if you show up in the paper, you have to buy ice cream for like everybody at your thing. So I think Carol, you owe us something at this point. Um, since your name keeps getting mentioned in all these shows. So Do her um, job well. <laughs> that's right. She is. She is. I, and I called her Miss Gardner, I think, in one of them before. So, um, And that is, Aaron, you know, if there's one thing we can change about um, New Century, uh, if we could somehow go back and rewrite history and card it, call it the Gardner Naval Station, um, I think it just gives a little bit more clout to the Gardner side. No offense to our friends in Olathe. Um, but uh, so, so the daily operations, uh, you know, like a lot of the, just, if I'm just driving by, if I'm a citizen of Gardner, typically what I'm aware of is some planes going in and out. Um, obviously the Chinooks when they're there, mm -hmm. the sonic boom when I'm lucky enough to see a fighter jet or um, I was out there the day, one of the, I think this, uh, maybe a year ago, a C5 came in. And I mean, those things look like, it's just like, just looks like it's suspended in the sky. It doesn't even look like it's flying. When I saw it bank around the the main building, and I was like, "Holy cow! I can't believe it!" It just you know it banked at that you know at that speed and whatever. What does the daily operations look like? Do you get ten planes a day? You get a hundred planes a day? I think I saw somewhere it's the third, second or third busiest airport in the state of Kansas. Is that true? Yeah, that's exactly right. So we are the third busiest towered airport in the state. And Johnson County Executive is fourth. So if you put our two together, we're second, and we're second only to um, Wichita's commercial airport, which has taken mm -hmm. in passengers and tons of flights, and that makes total sense. Yeah. Uh, but you're absolutely right. So uh, in 2019, the last year we have data for for a whole year, there was just shy of 57,000 flights in and out, takeoff wow. and landings at New Century alone, to put it in perspective. And that's based on, there's about 210 aircraft that are domicile or based here at New Century. The rest are transient. And so if there's not ticketed passengers, you might ask, who is that? You know, that includes, yes, the military. They do have a presence here with their, their Chinooks, but also Garmin has its world fleet here. And it's not just its corporate jets or corporate aircraft. It also does um, testing on retrofitting older airframes that may have the old knobs and dials and, and changing that into a touchscreen model. 
and they'll make a template here at New Century. They started one of the tea hangers with this business model and have grown it very successfully here to say the least. And that becomes the model that they'll use to install and aviation is one of their three biggest uh, revenue producers for Garmin today. But that will become the model they install on those retrofitting aircraft all around the country based on what they make here at New Century and one other place in the Northwest. Um, it's also one of the longest runways in the in the whole region. Other than MCI, it is the longest runway here at New Century, just shy of, of about 7,300, just over 7,300 feet. It has a towered airport or, or contract towered airport, which is a big deal to have that because of the traffic flow. So from six to 10 o'clock, there's, there's people up in the tower that are paid for by the FAA. We rent the top two floors because it's still part of the old military hangar that DOD has. Um, and we provide the equipment for them, but it's a great partnership to help kind of keep as safe as environment as you can with that much traffic coming in and out. There are tea hangers here as well that uh, we constantly spend a lot of time maintaining an update at both airports. But you're right on the C5. The C5 is the largest thing that flies today. If you can imagine it from tip to tip on the wings, you're talking 288 feet, almost a football field going sideways through the air. And to put in perspective, when you see those dual rotor Chinook helicopters, two of them can fit inside when they bend the blades back and can be transported. So when they came back from their last deployment, it was absolutely wild to see. And I'm sure that's what you're referring to, Jason. When yeah. they came in, they landed, took two thirds of the runway. That was it. Came in and you just saw these slowly being extracted. And you're just like, if, if, a, if a Martian came down to earth and you pointed to him and said, this can fly, they would look at you and go, well, we thought you were an intelligent species, but obviously you're clearly nuts because <laughs> this thing is ginormous. And if you think about the weight and what's in it, it's just remarkable to say the least. And we've hosted Air Force One was here in 2007 last. We often get a number of United States of America, blue and white planes uh, coming through that might be a cabinet secretary. That's always the kind of fun is when somebody lands, trying to figure out what's in the news and who's visited last. You know, what cabinet secretary had a meeting at Overland Park or something and then sneaks out and then there's articles in the paper the next day about them. So there's little things like that that are kind of fun. But uh, I would be remiss because he's called while we were on this discussion. The Kansas City Air Show will also, unfortunately, we were looking forward to hosting that Labor Day weekend. That was a terribly successful air show back in 2019 at mm -hmm. Downtown's Airport in Kansas City, Missouri, at Wheeler Airport. We were excited to host that, but due to COVID, that was not something that was going to be possible this, this year at Labor Day. However, we've been able to rebook, and it's really, we're providing, again, the infrastructure for it. So I want to give full credit to the KC Airso Charities that are putting this on, which is an incredible group of volunteers led by Kerry Floyd, an incredible group of people, same group that did the one in 2019. They're going to be back at New Century in 2021, and we're doing Fourth of July weekend. And the thing that's very special for that is, one, it's the Blue Angels, so it's Navy coming back home. Two, it's the 75th anniversary of that team doing its demonstration performance groups. And three, the lineup over the three days is absolutely wild because this group back in 2019 won air show sponsor of the year in terms of what they put on being a quality product. And so there's a lot of people that are interested in being part of their next gig. And so there's the chance that you know, if this is successful and there's a lot of detail and planning, they'll have to go into it. We're talking 25, 30,000 people a day trying to see the, that air show over a 4th of July weekend in 2021. So that's all, we've got a link to it on our website, the tickets and again, the finances and logistics in any way, we're supporting and coordinating with them, but KC Air Shows has done an incredible job. And we haven't, we've had some smaller air shows, but we haven't had a flight demonstration team here for a couple decades. So that will be a new big thing and a pretty exciting thing for, for New Century to say the least. But it, it, this is a perfect job, just to make one more point, this is a perfect job if you had, uh, if you got bored easily, because the reality is in any given day, you could have an aviation issue. You could have a, you know, a train railroad issue. I mean, it's wild that a government actually, we have engineers and switchmen on our staff. That's not all they do. They also do other things, but it's, it's so different and unique. I don't find a lot of peers to kind of go, Hey, how do you deal with this? Cause that's just not typically a government role. I don't know that we would do it if we didn't already inherit the, mile, the miles that we got of the old short line railroad from the Navy. But then you can have a water issue because water always finds a way to break and you get a new little fountain temporarily and get to go fix that little piece of public art. Um, so you, just, you know, streets, streets blow out, street lights don't work. Somebody slides in the rain into a street pole, light, street light of yours. You know, every day there's just a new adventure to say the least. And my kind of fun is at what point did I lose control of my day from a standpoint of this is what I wanted to do and this is what I get to do. You know, and it's just sometimes that's 1042, sometimes it's 105 and sometimes it's 803, you know. But I'm grateful that there's such a great staff out here. It's a very small staff that, you know, two of the busiest airports, a railroad, a million gallon a day water system, and kind of keeping the business park up is run by 18 people. Now, a lot of work is contracted out. That's the only way that happens. And nobody does just one thing. And that's the thing that's amazing about our staff. They could be railing in the morning 
and painting it a runway in the afternoon. There is there's so little consistency in what they do from a standpoint of the diversity of their activities. It's not even gray kissing cousins with each other. I mean, rail, water, air, you know, streets that just there's there's very little commonality and overlap there. So we're really grateful to have the people we do here. Okay. So Aaron, do you have, a, is your background in, do you have a background in aviation or is this just something you kind of fell into? Uh, probably okay. more of the second. Okay. Um, I, my okay. background in aviation has been uh, a steep learning curve in the last four years, but I'm very grateful that um, in many ways, if you've kind of listened to my description of this, I, my previous life, I worked for the county manager's office for Johnson County. Part okay. of that was the city administrator in Roland Park, Kansas. And in many ways, if you're kind of hearing a theme, one of my predecessors was affectionately referred to as the mayor of Monopoly land, because in theory, he's got airports, he's got water, he's got railroads, he's kind of got many of the pieces, he's got a lot of street names and businesses out here. He kind of is in many ways, almost like a mayor. And I think that's actually a very good way to look at it, that even the airport, because since we don't do the operational side, it's a lot of infrastructure, it's concrete, it's asphalt, it's that planning element. So I think the background of that, that, um, Masters in Public Administration is helpful, and I'm super lucky to have Larry Pete as our Deputy Director and been here for the last five years. Larry has a complete and full background in aviation. So many ways of those five cost centers, he kind of takes the lead on two of them, which are the two airports. I kind of take the lead on the other three, and it's been a great balance, to say the least. Just like our airport commission that has a good number of, of licensed pilots, but also you know us mere mortals that uh, try to hang with them and keep up with what they do, to say the least. And I mean, to be a pilot and an aviator, that's a very special thing, to say the least. And I'm always, you know, admiring just their their courage, their willingness, the cost that goes into it. But, you know, it's really special to, to take the time and dedication to get your license, to keep your license. And um, I don't know, just that that's the kind of group that I'm, you know, pretty proud to be associated around with, to say the least. Definitely. So, so Aaron, you already mentioned the, the COVID element of things and, and how it kind of pushed off the, the Blue Angel this year, but you know, ha has it affected you guys? You know, what, what have you guys seen? What have you guys done? Uh, all that. Sure. I think we're probably, there's about 30 plus groups within Johnson County government, and we are an agency of Johnson County government. We're probably one of the least impacted because in we were doing social distancing before it was important. And what I mean by that is I said we had 18 employees. We, we oversee about 3,000 acres between the two airports. So we have lots of space to spread out. And because we operate in some old buildings, they're very boxed up into walls. So everybody has their own space. So with the exception of the lobbying being closed for a little while at the New Century Administration Building for outside visitors. So we did things more on phone and email. Outside of that, for a short period of time, in many ways, we wear masks now. But minus that, a lot of life. You might be in the cab of the railroad engine on your own. You might be in a cab of a tractor mowing, you know, in the infield on your own. It really, it's had, I think, a pretty minimal impact here to say the least new century. And the businesses seem to have been doing some alterations, both to what they produce. One of the food makers has switched to making a lot more little packages of condiments because of, you know, home delivery kicking up so much with curbside delivery and things like that. Um, but, I, but there seems to be just based on the water usage, we haven't seen, in fact, water is up, water sales this year up compared to last year at this mm -hmm. point over year over year. Rail's down a little bit, but rail's been down nationally actually for about the last two years. But, but if you just look at water from a standpoint of what our food folks are doing, that, ha that has not really changed or gone down, which is a good sign that a lot of the stuff that's made here is a staple kind of item that doesn't fluctuate with the economy per se, or doesn't is yeah. not as sensitive to being impacted by the economy per se. So, but for, from a staff standpoint, you know, we're, we're being smart. We're following the directions of the county and the state, but uh, minus that, we've been very fortunate just because of the space we have and the mm -hmm. kind of buildings we had. Everybody had pretty much their own truck already to, to get around. We were doing so much individual work already. It seemed to kind of fit into that. And we we're very lucky as opposed to some groups that have had to make massive changes, huge mm -hmm. overtime and things like that. That really hasn't impacted us per se. Yeah, interesting. So there was a question on here, Aaron, about um, from David about uh, the tor tornado damage repairs. I believe that happened a year or two ago, and um, you know, and a plane crash last summer. So I mean, obviously, those are not those are probably of all the we got this great you know multi million dollar economic engine you know, that is the airport. And then there are probably things like that that are, I guess we'll call it more of a tragedy and things that happen um, and issues. So can you shed a little light on either of those? And, sure. um, and you know, and just how you plan for those types of things in general. So I'll start out on the bright news that you mentioned economic impact. And we just had a study done by the 
county's economic research institute called siri and the economic air impact from the county's two airports was estimated at 1.3 just under 1.3 billion dollars with wow. over 5,000 private sector jobs also being spun off because of those to put in perspective and about 228 million dollars in annual wages so they're they are economic engines in fact Really, Johnson County government does not encourage economic development in unincorporated Johnson County. They want it to be with the city, with the one exception that essentially New Century acts as the county's business park. Having said that, you're absolutely right. Even though we're not responsible for the operational side of the world when it comes to aviation, we're certainly impacted by it. So, yes, it was March 7th, a Tuesday, 2017. Remember it well. I was here at New Century working. And we're, and we're directly, the two airports are right in alignment with each other, about six miles apart. New Century is on the west. I remember being at my desk and gosh, it's windy out. You could really hear it roaring. And then a little bit later, I unfortunately stepped out to use the bathroom and our deputy director, Larry Pete, lives by executive airport. He went down to executive airport and he calls and leaves me a voicemail and just says, the tea hangers on the east side are gone. Mm -hmm. And I was like, there, there's no way. I, I, I'm sure he, I, it's dark, it, whatever. I call him back and said, Larry, what are you talking about? He goes, I'm looking at it, you know, Tango's gone, Papa's damaged, Sierra's damaged. I'm like, okay, I'm away. And we don't know at that point because people will be working in the evenings on their planes. They might be, you know, changing out something or, or getting ready for a next day flight. You don't know who's in their hangars. You don't know. At that point, I didn't know the material condition, the power's out. There's the smell of gas, even though we don't have gas in those hangars, there's gas nearby. At private hangars that that uh, that was damaged, and I remember being on site. Um, Overland Park was there first. Olathe was there. The response of the first responders was amazing. You know, the first thing you did is to see if there was anybody in any of those five hangars that had about uh, ninety different units in it, and mm -hmm. fortunately nobody was in them. Um, then then it became a matter the next day of just trying to assess the damage. And the pictures were unbelievable. Johnny, God bless Johnny Rollins, wanted to get up in the air so bad to get aerial shots of it, and he did. He got great photos that next morning. The airport was closed for about 12 hours. We had to go through and pick up all the FOD around the foreign object issues that could be hazards to navigation or aviation around the runway. Once we got that mm -hmm. done, we were open by about eight o'clock the next morning. And Johnny got up, got incredible photos. And it was a 90 mile an hour plus straight wind. That same storm that went through, by the time it hit Missouri, was an F1 tornado, did damage to houses, several hundred homes. I mean, it was it just picked up power as it went uh, west to east. And so that be, and somebody told us, and of course, my favorite is whenever something goes wrong, you want to ask somebody else, how did you deal with this? And I thought, Joplin, you know, they had a big tornado. What did they do? So that next morning, one of the first calls I was excited to make to our peer at the, was the airport director. And he goes, I don't know what I could add. It's like, well, of course you can. You know, Joplin had all that damage from the tornado. And he goes, yeah, our airport was two miles outside of town. We were the only part of county or city government that wasn't impacted. <laughs> Thanks. Goodbye. So that that didn't help. And we actually couldn't find a really good example of what happens when you have the different conflicting interests of a county that has insurance and cares about the building. You have tenants that care about getting their hangar, their plane out of the hangar, most of which are so damaged you can't just raise a, ton, a one ton door to get them out on their own like they normally would function. In some cases, the building's ripped up or in some cases, parts of other buildings are laying on it or in other cases, the building is not structural enough sound enough that you feel comfortable energizing that door. But then they may have home items in there. So there may be homeowners insurance or automobiles that care. And all of a sudden we went from having about 90 people interested to several hundred because everybody had a different angle on this. And somebody told me it'll take over a year to take the planes out, tear them down and rebuild. And I thought that was the most pompous thing I've ever saw. I couldn't believe that that'd be true. It was, we didn't reopen those tea hangers until September of 2018. And it took that long to extract the planes. Now the good news was, with a lot of additional investment and effort, we were able to ensure that no planes received any more damage, extracting them out of the buildings and then what they received upon the initial impact of that storm, which all things considered, if you ever see an aerial photo, you kind of realize how difficult a job that was to kind of unlayer to get to that and not do any of that damage. So mm -hmm. ultimately we were able to rebuild the same number of hangars where we were on that east side um, and reopen and, and everyone who was there before had rights of first opportunity to come back, many of which did, some of which didn't, some of which the pilots lost their plane, they may have been a point in their career where they decided it's not worth replacing, took the insurance check and 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 mm -hmm. kind of rode off in the sunset. But we have a wait list for those tea hangers still today, um, just like Gardner does in every airport in the metropolitan area. And, um, you know, it, that was officially day like, oh, 48 or so for me on the job. That was a great way to start. It was the largest property loss uh, in Johnson County history for at least the previous 25 years for county government. So needless to say, but everybody pitched in, you know, Olathe Fire, Overland Park Fire, 
EMS, county manager's office, everybody down to the park police helped us guard, you know, those broken up tea hangers for the first couple of days from Johns County Parks and Rec, the sheriff's office. I mean, everybody pitched in to help when we needed help. And just like we would do the same, you know, if there's a situation, the airport could help public works or somebody else in the future. And then Jack, Jason, your second comment was on the unfortunate plane crash that took place on New Year's Eve, 2019. Um, there is a number of, we'll say, plane crashes that take place. Um, most of them, fortunately, they're able to, they're able to land, you may have damage to the plane, but you don't have a fatality or significant injury. Um, there are a number of those that you don't hear about, and that's fine. You know, you don't hear about every car accident that, that uh, doesn't have a fatality either. Having said that, since I've been here, we've had two. One was a person who was flying back from Florida, and it's unclear what happened to his plane. He crashed somewhere in Missouri. He was a tea hanger leaseholder here at New Century a couple of years ago. But then on New Year's Eve, we had two folks that had come into Johnson County Executive. My understanding was they were flying. He was flying his dad's plane from Arkansas. He was looking at buying a plane because there's plane sales. That's one of the other things we haven't talked about. At Johnson County Executive is one of the FBOs is a, also a plane uh, distribution group for, for new sales and resales. So we're looking at, he was looking at buying his own plane. He came up here, looked at it. And then went to take off to go back to Arkansas, is my understanding. They made it just a little bit off the runway, started corkscrewing down, and unfortunately crashed. And both of the passengers were killed. And that was a case, again, where, again, airport shut down. Airport staff showed up. Johnson, you know, Fire District for Olathe, Overland Park, Sheriff, um, KBI, High Patrol. I mean, every, just the incredible response that took place there and went through the course of the evening. And so you never want fatality crashes in the the, the Federal Transportation Safety Administration is looking into that. They've done an initial report, but they do a long, extensive, because they always want to look for lessons learned. Was this pilot error? How much of it contributed to pilot error? How much of it's contributed to some manufacturing error or something needs to be retrofitted on all aircraft of that nature to try to prevent something like that from happening in the future? And so that's what's kind of being investigated and looked into in the future. It wasn't the runway. The runway was brand new. The weather conditions were good. It was clear skies, very little wind. So it really does look like it was more of something, you know, contributed to some other factor in that sense. So while you never want a fatality, that's, that was our first fatality for a plane leaving for New Century or Johnson County Executive in a number of years. And that's a record we'd like to start building back up again. Yeah, definitely. Well, and I, I, I guess for a lot of people and just me as a novice, not understanding flying that much, I mean, it, it would, I guess I would assume that it's a very similar process just at a smaller scale when that happens with a, two person passenger plane as a 200 person jumbo jet, you know, type yeah. thing. So um, yeah. that makes NTSB sense. comes in and investigates all of them. Exactly right. Gotcha. Well, we're getting, we're, we're kind of getting towards, towards the end here where we normally would wrap up. And I guess one of the things, I mean, Aaron, you've shared a ton of information. Is there anything that we didn't cover today or you didn't get a chance to cover that, you know, uh, uh, some kind of secret about, New Century Air Center that everybody should know. I mean, you let the cat out of the bag about Duke's mayonnaise, although you can't buy that in the local grocery stores for whatever reason. Um, is there anything that you know that we didn't get a chance to cover today about New Century Air Center or or John County Executive Airport? No, I appreciate the the Duke's mayonnaise joke uh, reference. There is that you could buy it. It's made here. Could go right about a block north to the Amazon distribution facility and get it shipped through Amazon to somewhere in Kansas, but you're exactly right. The distribution network quite hasn't hit the price choppers of the world just yet, but uh, That's it's right. good stuff, I'll tell you that. Um, you know, it's just, it's just, this is just a very special place. And I'm sure many people say that about where they work, but if you think about one, the history, the incredible rich history that took place here, which created the, even the opportunity for us to have these airports, that's so significant. Two, you think about what's gone into transition these into what the FAA desires to have these places be as self-sufficient as they are, to be so highly utilized and to have such diverse, both aviation businesses and non-aviation businesses here. To think about the specialness of the fact that you've got, you could ship out by air, you could ship out by truck, you could ship in by rail. You've got a truly multimodal facility all in one place existing here today now that's ready to turn on for a business that wants to come in and expand and develop here at New Century, for example. And, and again, I don't want to leave out Johnson County Executive. It's the fourth busiest airport, 40 plus thousand takeoff and landings a, a year, you know, wait list for the tea hangers and other FBOs looking to be built there for the first time in a number of decades. I mean, just some exciting stuff taking place over there as well. And, and the fact that a lot of this is done uh, with the help of just, you know, 18 folks for a staff to make that all happen 
you know, I had a, a, an aviation attorney expert on site a couple of years ago and I asked him, he'd worked with us, but never been on site or really knew our business ops. And we kind of gave him a windshield tour and I asked him how many employees we had between the two airports. He said 92. And I said, how about 18? He goes, what, to run the railroad? I was like, thank you. That made my day to say the least. But the, but the last thing that makes this work is partnerships. It's the fact it's the public and private sector working together people like BNSF or uh, private sector developers working here. It's also the different uh, you know, consultants that are trying to help bring businesses into Kansas or site here at Kansas in, at, uh, at uh, New Century. But it's also the chambers like yours. It's also working with the Southwest EDC, Johnson County government, Fire District 1. If we're not all rowing in the same direction, we're going to lose. Because the bottom line is when it comes to development and the reason development matters is because it brings money and money pays for the airports. If we're not rowing together, we're going to lose to Nashville, Tennessee, Omaha, Nebraska, Denver, Dallas, Fort Worth for these same exact kind of businesses. And they are working together. So if we're not working together or we're seeing, you know, we can be competitive internal, but if we're not getting along on the basic level, that's very noticeable. And why would a group want to make multi, multi million dollar decades long decisions to invest here if they don't see that from the beginning? So the fact that cities, counties, private, public, you know, groups like yours all really do kind of row in the same direction. And there's times they win great. There's times we win great. But as long, you know, I want the development in Kansas City. I don't want those jobs and I don't want those opportunities and those dollars to be going to another place, you know, around us. We've got so much in our favor from a rail, from a heart of the United States, from an infrastructure and, and surface transportation mode that we logistically should be dominating this industry. And we do very well at it. You know, the Kansas City Chamber, the Kansas City Area Development Council, all of them have been huge leaders in that effort, to say the least. So I, it's it's I'm not surprised and wouldn't be surprised if most people don't know much of what we talked about today. Why would they? Unless you yeah. work here, you don't fly to here. But I, I'm just grateful and very thankful you gave me a few minutes to come in and talk just a little bit about where we've been, where we are and where we're trying to go. Because I think that kind of helps communicate the message that, you know, these are important assets to the county. They were huge as part of the county's growth, even during the World War era. The military's presence in Johnson County between here and Sunflower Ammunition Plants were big backbones of employers, employment opportunities for Johnson County residents, you know, 50, 75 years ago. And kind of how that's grown into what we have today. And I think it's something we have, I think anybody could be very proud of because of its near self-sufficiency because of you know the jobs that are provided, because of the uh, you know pretty safe record when it comes to uh, aviation and other operations. So you're always welcome. You can drive through Johnson County or New Century. You can drive by Johnson County Executive. It's not really a road through it, but New Century. You can drive by. And the last thing I just leave you with: if anybody listening is interested in aviation or have kids or grandkids or nieces and nephews, come to one New Century Parkway. Put that address in your GPS. That's our admin building, and sit on the east side sometime between four and six o'clock. And just watch the amount of traffic coming in and out of people coming home or people going back to wherever they came from that day uh, and just watch the airport traffic. You'll see military helicopters. You'll see little one single engine pistons to you. Some, every once in a while, you'll see some charter jet that may come in to have some service work done like a 737 or something even larger. So but it's just a great opportunity. And usually aviation you know, keeps people's interest. And sometimes they're not even young people. It keeps their interest as well. So but you're always welcome to sit in our parking lot and kind of watch some of those operations take place. Awesome. Well, Aaron, thank you so much. I, you know, I, I think you ended on a great note too, because the partnership and I think, uh, you know, from the city of Gardner's perspective, and I'm sure, um, you know, I, I'm sure Olathe would probably feel the same way. I mean, the, the impact that it has in our community, I mean, the jobs, the, the people who fly in and out of there, um, things like the, you know, opportunity for leisure, such as the air show next summer, um, I think they're huge. I mean, even in, and even if you're a business owner in Gardner, you, you know that half of those employees are coming and eating lunch at an Austin's or Absolutely. a Tom's during the day. And, um, you know, so it's a significant impact. And whether it's, uh, you know, I'd love to say one day maybe we'll annex you, but I'm sure there's probably some le legality issues there. But um, we do appreciate that impact and we appreciate the partnership. I know from the chamber, the EDC, um, it's important to all of us and, and we're glad that we're able to work with you and, and we're really glad that you were able to come on and share a lot of this information. I learned a lot. I need to go pick up a book somewhere, or maybe pick up that little pamphlet from, uh, uh, the historical society. Adam, do you have any final words? You know, in, in, in Jason, stay in your lane. The legal side is me. Uh, so, you know, stay in your lane. Uh, actually I know nothing about airport, uh, uh law. So, you know, 
I'll, I'll defer that to Aaron. But no, Aaron, I, I appreciate you coming on today. You guys are so important to the community uh, and, and everything that you do is so important to the Gardner area as well. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to learn about the history. And, and, you know, again, shout out Bob Barker. I didn't know we we're going to talk about him today. So, uh, you know, that's always a great day for me. But no, I appreciate you coming on and, and sharing uh, everything for, for our National Aviation Month and, and all of that. But it uh, looks like you guys are, are on for, for uh, great things in the near future. And I, I look forward to the growth. Thank awesome. You. Appreciate well, it. As we, wrap, as we wrap up today, I always want to share a couple upcoming events for everybody who's watching. Uh, this Sunday, probably the, the best event on this list, Cobblers for a Cause. If you like cobbler or pie, um, Betty's Pies and Cobblers does this as a fundraiser for their Yes, I Can scholarship fund at Gardner Edgerton High School. Um, it's a one o'clock on uh, one o'clock on Sunday. My understanding is five dollars gets you like a piece of pie or pie and pie a la mode or who knows cobblers. Um, but it goes quick. So um, get there. It's going to be actually at the new Warren Place Event Center. Um, over off of Warren uh, Street there, just east of Main Street. Beautiful new facility there. Uh, tomorrow being Veterans Day, I know it's a bank holiday, um, but I also know that Johnson County has a virtual celebration for Veterans Day. I also know that the city of Gardner is uh, has kind of gone virtual with theirs this year. They have, I believe, a gift for all veterans if you swing by City Hall today or on Thursday. Uh, next week is Global Entrepreneurs uh, Global Entrepreneurship Week. Um, so if you're an aspiring entrepreneur or know somebody that is, uh, the K Casey Source Link, which is one of our partners in Kansas City, uh, puts on a ton of programs, free programs next week for all ages, all levels of entrepreneurs. And last but not least, the Mobile Food Pantry, Harvester's Mobile Food Pantry takes place next Wednesday, uh, which I believe would be November 18th. Uh, around one o'clock and that's over at Divine Mercy Catholic Church and uh, they've been serving I think last uh, last month they served 150 families and they distribute like 10,000 pounds of food each month so uh, just in Gardner alone so uh, a few upcoming events uh, Aaron as we sign off thank you again uh, we wish you the best of the rest of the season and we all are looking forward to the air show next year July 4th weekend and uh, we'll hopefully at some point have somebody from the air show and maybe you on at some point down the line to talk a little bit more about that. That'd be great. You bet. Thank awesome. you. Thank you guys all very much. Have a great Thanks, day. Guys.